I really am going to have to figure out some kind of like hairstyle, but anyway, we're talking history today. It doesn't matter. Hello there, I'm Cassidy Cash. Today we're exploring the history of the Lord Chamberlain's men. This is the name for Shakespeare's playing company before they became the King's Men in 1603. James I patronized the playing company and it becomes the King's Men. But before that, they're called the Lord Chamberlain's Men because they're patronized by the Lord Chamberlain. This was a government position in England for the 17th century, and at this time it was held by a man named Henry Carey. If you're new to the idea of patronage in 17th century England, it may be a little confusing confusing to understand what a patron was, how they became one, and exactly what they did, other than obviously being the money behind the operation, exactly how did this system work? And how did they support a playing company? And did that mean that they were in charge? To find out the answer to all of these questions, we sat down with Stephanie Klein, who runs the popular Tudor Enthusiast website and is the author of Edward VI, Henry VIII's Overshadowed Son, which is published by Pen and Sword's book and will be out later this year. Here's what Stephanie had to say. Elizabethan theater, this is sort of a time of, of major transition in the world of, of theater in early modern England. Um, kind of before this period, what we had was playing companies that were much more likely to be touring around the country or the region. And these playing companies made up of actors and writers, kind of everybody who produced these plays, uh, they would play primarily in inns and taverns and they were on, right? They weren't very stable. They didn't have um, a home base. They might not have been very uh, financially stable either. So what was sort of the norm for the time was noble patrons who would have an interest in entertainment and had an interest in in the way that theater was sort of booming in the later half of the 16th century. They wanted to be able to provide their households with entertainment. Certainly somebody who was serving the queen or or the king, if it had been a king, would um, would have taken a great interest in patronizing one of these playing companies to make them the most successful. And we see Again, this is a time of flux for, for theater and it's growing significantly. If we look at the earlier part of the 16th century and even the medieval period, any plays that we're really seeing being performed are very much depicting biblical stories or their morality plays. They're um, really enforcing the concepts of good versus evil or right versus wrong. And in the later half of the 16th century, we're seeing the stories taking shape and the plays that are being written uh, moving more towards, I guess, more creative stories. You know, we're seeing comedies and tragedies and romances, and and we're moving into that period where a lot more can be said in theater. And certainly, there were many people who were very hostile to that, who thought that plays were becoming sinful and not worth watching. And there was some hostility in um, a, a Puritan culture that's arising. Um, innkeepers and, and tavern workers were not always very welcoming to these troops of actors, right? So the reason why we're starting to see, um, actually in about 1576, we get a new theater that uh, starts up by James Burbage um, called The Theater. And this is sort of the beginning of where we see these stable areas in London that pop up for playing companies that can prove themselves to be successful and financially competent they can start playing in these um, in these theaters and they're not going to be so uh, reliant on on sort of traveling playing company model that had been uh, so popular. So noble patrons made this possible. People like Henry Carey, who were in situations where he could very, very easily financially support um, and bring shareholders into this model to support a playing company and then share and split the funds. Um, he was a perfect person to do this. So we actually have some evidence that what came to be known as the Lord Chamberlain's men, its origins may have actually started in, 15, in the 1560s when uh, Henry Carey was first Baron Hunsdon and not Lord Chamberlain. At this time, whatever group he was patronizing was called Hunsdon's men. And then later, of course, we know he became Lord Chamberlain of the household in the 1580s. In 1594, we see that uh, we have a group now that's called the Lord Chamberlain's Men. 
as you said, it was it was founded by Elizabeth I, who had a great interest in theater and really cared very deeply about providing quality entertainment to her court. And we have record from the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography entry on Henry Carey that he saw this as one of his chief duties as Lord Chamberlain to provide Elizabeth and her court with the greatest quality entertainment that the country could provide. So this absolutely fell into the umbrella of duties that he would have had in this prestigious post. Um, and, and it actually is a, it shows just how popular and how successful this playing company was that at the time of Elizabeth's death and the accession of King James I in 1603, this moved from a noble patronage into a royal patronage and James I took it over and it became the King's men. Now you know a little more about how patronage works and Shakespeare's relationship with Henry Carey. If you'd like to know more about Henry Carey personally, including his military exploits, how he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth, and his seemingly scandalous love affair, then you can explore more in our full episode with Stephanie on the podcast right now. Check out CassidyCash.com slash episode 255. Not only can you listen to our complete conversation full of at least eight other questions about Henry the... Henry, no, full of at least eight other questions about Henry Carey that you can learn more about his life and times, but there's also archival information, including woodcuts and portraits and even museum, um, what are they called? Not museum exhibits, but items, objects, I guess, but from places like the V&A and the Folger, and we gather all this related stuff and we put it into the show notes for the episode. So it's a great place to hear the audio of our conversation, but you can also see visual elements that coordinate with the show that are excellent resources for research and study all packed into the show notes. So all of that is CassidyCash.com slash episode 255. You can type that into your URL bar, but there's a nice little link below this video as well. To explore more about Shakespeare and turn of the 17th century England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, check out my Shakespeare History Tidbits playlist or any of the other playlists on That Shakespeare Life YouTube channel because there's a ton of history to explore. That's it for this week. I'm Cassidy Cash, and I hope you learned something new about the Bard. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.